Hello and welcome to today's webinar on how to progress from inherited research. My name is Trisha Labby, events manager here at American Ancestors and New England Historic Genealogical Society. I'll be moderating today's program. This webinar is brought to you by the Brew Family Learning Center. American Ancestors and New England Historic Genealogical Society is a nonprofit organization supported by our members and donors. We provide resources and expertise in nearly all aspects of family history, and we're pleased to offer such programming for our members and friends around the world. Our presenter today is genealogist Ann Lothers. Ann helps members and not yet members with their family history research by providing lectures, courses, and hands-on workshops at the American Ancestors Research Center at genealogical conferences across the country and of course, online. She's a graduate of Wellesley College and the Harvard School of Public Health with master's and doctoral degrees in health policy. Her areas of particular interest include New England and New York, the Mid-Atlantic states, the Southern colonies and migration patterns. The presentation today will focus on how to best deal with research you have inherited from either family members or others and how to utilize that wealth of resources and information to continue on your own genealogical research. Sifting through someone else's work might seem overwhelming at first, but can lead to valuable clues or even larger discoveries when dealt with properly. Anne will discuss how to organize and evaluate what you have and how to then plan to verify and progress from this research. At any point during the presentation, feel free to type your questions into the Q&A panel. To access that panel, you can click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen, type and submit. We'll address as many questions at the end of the presentation as possible. In this Zoom webinar, you also have the ability to turn on live closed captioning. Located near your other Zoom controls, you'll see either a closed captioning live transcript button or a three dot ellipses button. If you click on one of those, you have the option to choose live transcription, and this will enable live transcriptions to show on your screen as we talk. There's no handout for this lecture, but the session is being recorded, and you'll have access to that recording on our website or YouTube channel. So if you miss anything during our live broadcast today, not to worry, you can always review the presentation later. I'll be sending out a follow-up email to all registrants with the link to the recording later today. Finally, a reminder that we are all still working remotely and broadcasting from our own homes with a variety of technology and internet levels. So if either us or you experience any technical difficulties during the presentation, we appreciate your patience. And as I mentioned, you'll have access to that full recording to review on your own time. So that takes care of all of my housekeeping items. Um, without further ado, I'll pass things over to Anne to get started. Thank you, Tricia. As we think about our new year, we may be thinking that it is time to tackle the boxes of material that Aunt June left us, or maybe the binders of research that grandmother Jennifer lovingly created and preserved and that we have now inherited. But the task seems too daunting. How do we know what we have? How do we know what to save? How can we move from the chaos of stuff to organization and adding our relatives research to our tree? How do we know how accurate our relatives research actually is? So the objectives for today's webinar focus on starting with taking stock of the contents of your inherited location uh, collection. You will also learn about strategies for classifying and organizing the materials. I will introduce you to the genealogical proof standard principles and tell you how you can use these as a guide to evaluate the value of your collection. And then I will talk about making a plan of action for future research. So these four objectives translate into four steps for the uh, process. 
we're talking today about moving forward with inherited research. So our focus is on genealogical papers. But you have probably also inherited family papers. So what's the difference? Genealogical research papers can consist of compiled genealogies, family charts, family group sheets, maybe some photographs, notes, etc. Usually they have some sort of organization. They may be in binders or folders, and often they are a mixture of original materials and photocopies. Now, some of you may be caretakers of family papers that have been lovingly preserved and passed down through the years. They may consist of Bible records, diaries, photographs, scrapbooks, business records. These papers are often unorganized. But since we can't talk about genealogical papers without talking about family papers, I will be referring to both types of materials when I talk about organization and classification. So a little story. Around the year 2000, so 20 plus years ago, I received several boxes of material from various family members that had belonged to my grandmother, Jennifer. The family members knew I was interested in taking responsibility for family materials, and they were more than ready to get them out of their houses. When I opened the boxes, the materials that I had inherited were eclectic, to say the least. Two boxes were books, the history of Concord, Massachusetts, history of Mercer County, Pennsylvania, Westerwall to America, about Palatinate immigrants to Pennsylvania, and lots of other books. One box was full of papers. Some of the papers I'm going to show you. For example, this one was a single sheet of paper, and it says the Cheney line. The genealogy has very valuable information, but I don't really know where it's from or who created it. I can guess based on the handwriting that it was probably written by my grandmother, Jennifer, or maybe her mother-in-law, Maud. They had very similar handwriting. Now, this is definitely Maud's handwriting, and the document header says from Deborah H. G. Newton's book in Petersham, Massachusetts, April 13th, 1825. Great. It tells me where it's from. But what is Deborah's book? Is it a Bible? Is it a prayer book? Is it a genealogy? And, and this piece of paper over here on the side was actually stapled to this other uh, page. Again, no idea. Uh, where that information came from. So I'm calling this document um, Maud's, Maud's copy of Deborah Hall Grosvenor Newton's material. The box also held a couple of sheets that looked as though they were a draft of a family history. This page has all the hallmarks of my grandfather's style typing and then cutting and pasting materials into the lines uh, to revise them. And then there was this glorious fan chart with lots of penciled and some penned information about my mother's family. I had seen my grandmother, Jennifer, working on this chart over the years. I've overlaid colors onto the chart to show the major family lines. Green over here is for the husband's mother. Here we have blue for uh, Grosvenor, the husband's father. Yellow. For George. Jennifer's organization was a little different than what would be considered uh, state of the art today. The yellow would have been over here and the blue would have been on the, the bottom left. Over time, I've been able to confirm a lot of what is in this chart, but there were a couple of curious mistakes. 
So you've inherited all this stuff. What are you planning to do with it? What is your ultimate goal? That is something you need to really give some serious thought to. Are you looking to solve genealogical brick walls with this inherited material? Are you hoping that it will provide a new focus for your research? Are you interested in writing a book? Do you want to donate these materials to a repository or to some other organization? Are you most interested in preserving this to give it to the next generation? Do you need to downsize and you have too many boxes? How do you ensure your paper's survival? You need four steps. And these four steps come from the objectives that I mentioned earlier. The first step is taking stock, surveying and inventorying. Second step is organizing. Then you evaluate. You evaluate both the original documents that you've been given as well as the summary material. And then you plan. You make a plan of action so that you can continue the research. Step one may be the hardest, and that is to identify what you have so that you can begin the process of organization. So why should you take stock? First and foremost, you don't really know what you have until you look at everything. As I discovered when preparing for this presentation, looking at your collection when you receive it is not the same as looking at your collection, say, 5, 10, or in my case, 20 years later. I have discovered new insights from the collection when I looked at it with 20 years of researching experience under my belt. And I'm going to describe some of those really nifty findings to you in the course of this lecture. Now, if you are interested in integrating your relative's work into your own, you need to look at what summaries you've inherited and whether or not there is any supporting documentation for those summaries. And what is the condition of the material? Are there any fragile items? Hint, remove the staples. While this webinar is not about preserving your collection, we do have a webinar called Organizing and Preserving Your Family Papers, and it really focuses on the preserving part. So if you go to our website, up at the top of the page, you have a number of options. If you click on Tools, you can then select Video Library, and from the uh, Video Library, scroll down uh, to find the Organizing and Preserving Your Family Papers webinar. There are two levels of taking stock, survey versus inventory. A survey, according to the dictionary, is to consider or view comprehensively, to appraise, to examine as to its condition, situation, or value. It's a high-level look. You might consider yourself standing on a hill and looking out over a landscape. An inventory, on the other hand, is much more detailed. It's an itemized list of current assets. It's a list of good on hands. Think about the inventory that you might find in a probate packet. So what is it that you have? Do you have letters? Maybe you've got scrapbooks. How about diaries, journals, account books? Bible records, compile genealogies with or without citations, photographs, are the people in the photographs identified? What's the genealogical information? You may even have school papers and records as well as legal documents. Another facet of the survey process is identifying the names associated with your collection. After all, as a genealogist, you are seeking names. So you need to identify who created the letters, the scrapbooks and other items. 
Review the photographs. Can you identify the people in the photographs? And as I said, do note the condition of the material. So overall, the goal of your first step, the goal of your survey is to one, identify the types of materials in your collection, two, assess the condition of those materials, and three, identify the major surnames that are captured by your collection. Now, you will need to write down the results of your survey. There's no point in doing the work if you're not going to record the results. On the left hand side of the screen is a simple five category survey that groups your collection into genealogical materials such as group sheets, compiled genealogy or notes, written materials such as letters, diaries, journals and books, documents, and by documents, I mean the, uh, uh, the, the supporting uh, it, information about a vital event, such as a certificate or record of birth or a land deed or a probate packet, photos, and memorabilia. Memorabilia sort of ends up being a catch-all. On the right-hand side of your screen is an example of a form that we use here uh, in our archives department and that the Jewish Heritage Center, which is part of American Ancestors, uses to accession their materials. At the top of the form is a space to list the families in the collection. So the collection name, I'm calling it by my grandmother, uh, the names in the collection include Plowman, Homer, and Bell. Um, the major contributors to the collection were my grandmother and her mother-in-law. Um, and I've got journals, letters, photos, and books. And then down below, it's a more detailed list of document types, special formats such as scrapbooks or born digital materials, um, whether or not there are any conservation or preservation uh, concerns, etc. Now, for an inventory, you will need to touch every item in your collection, evaluate it, and write down a description of the item. This example of uh, an inventory I put into an Excel spreadsheet, um, and I included the box number, a description of the item, when it was created, who created it, and the condition of the item. These two columns, when it was created and who created it, are questions that you will be revisiting when you evaluate the um, accuracy of what you have received from your ancestor. So here it, you see that in box number one, there was a journal by Maud, um, the fan chart, that I showed you the photo of, letters from Fred Homer to Jenny Homer, and an envelope of photographs. Now that you have an idea of what's in your collection, you need to organize it so that as you work with it, you minimize the amount of repeated shuffling through papers. So step two is classify and organize. Start by taking note of the current organization system. Is there one? Are they in binders or is it just a, a pile? Now, what should I save? Should I save everything? Not necessarily. You need to save what is unique and significant. Obviously, original materials such as diaries and letters are uh, obvious ones to save, but also consider those items that tell a specific story, such as a handwritten autobiography written by uh, your great grandmother, or some memento that has special meaning to you or a loved one. But what about all those genealogical research papers? Do you need to keep 20 copies of the same family group sheet? I don't think so maybe two at most. Definitely keep your most recent version if you've made a, an attempt 
to write a story or your ancestor has attempted to write a narrative, uh, but you don't need the, the uh, previous 20 drafts. You need the all the paperwork from past genealogical research conferences. For some individuals, that's important, but for others of you, not so much. And don't forget to label as you begin to organize. At this stage, you begin to refine your classification scheme. A good arrangement will group like items together so that you don't have to look in several places for closely related items. Now, records can be um, arranged in a variety of ways, including by name or chronologically or whatever. There is no one right way to organize a collection. You need to organize it by whatever makes most sense for you. A common organizational scheme for genealogical materials is by surname or by family line. So many genealogists start by putting um, things into four boxes, uh, one for each of the ancestral lines, and they often use a color coding system such as blue for the father's father, um, red for the mother's father, etc. Now at the next level down, so within surname or within family line, you might organize by individual or by a couple or by an event. It depends on how you think and how you tend to use material. A third or fourth level of organization considers grouping by type of material, such as genealogical material, documents, written photos, memorabilia or by location or by record type. And record type is my own uh, personal preference, um, but that's just the way that I tend to use these materials. Remember, when it comes to organizing your family pa papers, keep it simple, but do be consistent. So you are going to need to write down whatever organizational uh, scheme you come up with. And do start small. Looking at boxes of material can be quite overwhelming at first. So start small and do uh, the work a box at a time or a line at a time. So now you're beginning to be ready to organize those papers. In the survey, you've identified genealogical materials, written materials, documents, but now you have an organizational scheme, perhaps family surname one, a box for say the Lothers family. And within that box, um, folders with genealogical material, documents, written material, photographs and memorabilia. Then family surname two, for example, Plowman and the same grouping of types of material within that grouping. You can also think of your organizational scheme as nested layers. At the top level is the surname group and within the surname group are multiple individuals. And then within each individual's file, you either have the type of material that I just showed you or type of record such as vital record, church record, census record, land record. And the small teal circle represents the item as you file it. Then you can place your collection into containers. You know what's in it. You know how you plan to organize it. Now you need to put it into containers so that you can easily retrieve it when you are working with it. And those containers can be file folders or it could be some sort of box system. You are also probably beginning to think about the question of, should I digitize or not? Now, once you have your organization scheme, the next logical step would be digitization. 
the advantages of digitaliza uh, digitization is that it makes your materials readily available and they're very easy to take around with you so that if you are going on a research trip, you could take a little thumb drive with all your basic material and have it literally at your fingertips. Now, your file naming will probably keep order to your files. A standard file naming strategy is who, the person, when, the date, and by doing it that order, who first, when second, means that everything for a specific individual be, will be in chronological order um, when it's digitized. What is it? And where? So here we have Homer Jacob. I could have put a, a dash in between Homer and Jacob, but that's one, one more keystroke. Um, and I'm all about efficiency. The date, what it was, it was a deed and where it was, Emmitsburg, Maryland. Now, another advantage of digitization is it's a serious space saver. It does have some big disadvantages. First of all, and the one that I worry about all the time, is storage technology continually changes. How many of you have any kind of device that could read a floppy disk now? It's even hard to find uh, storage devices, I mean, uh, technology that will uh, read those uh, smaller uh, storage floppies. Remember the zip drives? That's all gone by. Another disadvantage of digitization is it's potentially time consuming, particularly if you have a lot of paper. And finally, if you're not comfortable with computers and digital, there's a pretty steep learning curve. OK, you've taken stock. You've organized your materials. Now you are ready to reflect and evaluate the material that you have received. The research you have inherited may be only 10 years old. But it may also be 50 years old or even 100 or more years. As you look at your uh, inherited papers, you need to consider that good genealogical practice has evolved considerably in that time. Did you know that Lemuel Shattuck, one of the founders of the New England Historic Genealogical Society developed the very earliest versions of the two most used forms in genealogical research. He developed a prototype for the family group sheet and the pedigree chart. He also contributed to the design of the 1850 census, and he was a founder, a co-founder of the American Statistical Association. Well, he developed these forms in 1841. And beginning about 1880, there was a huge surge in the popularity of compiled genealogies. Now, compiled genealogies were typically put together by one person spending several years engaged in corresponding with relatives and learning facts about different branches of the family. Unfortunately for history, most of the letters that went into the making of such genealogies have not survived. So we don't know anything about the person who provided the information. In 1964, almost 60 years ago, the Board for Certification of Genealogists was formed to um, credential professional genealogists. At that time, genealogists typically sought material from courthouses, cemeteries, churches, and other on the ground type uh, establishments. 1990s was the dawn of the internet with AOL, Prodigy, and Netscape. And it wasn't until 2000 that the Board for Certification of Genealogists published their genealogical proof standard, which is what guides our evaluation process today. 
So what is the genealogical proof standard? First, it's a reasonably exhaustive research. Notice reasonably, it's not about exhaustive. Complete and accurate source citations. You need to document where you found the information. Thorough analysis and correlation. You're not relying on a single document, you're relying on several pieces of paper or information, and you are making sure that there are no conflicts, or if there are conflicts, that you can resolve them. So one person says they were born in 1850, another person says they were born in 1855, which is correct. The genealogical proof process helps you evaluate which one is correct. So in terms of inherited research, one might rephrase these principles as, number one, does your collection include original documents? Two, is the origin of the source um, written down? Does it have some form of citation? Three, how does your inherited research compare to your own research? And four, can you explain any contradictions? So using the genealogical proof standard as a uh, guide, the first step for evaluating your inherited research is one, check your collection for any original documents. This will be a proxy for the reasonably exhaustive search. Two, check your forms, check the write-ups for any documentation of where the information came from. Three, compare the new material to your existing material. Is there anything new? Are there areas of disagreement? This corresponds to elements three and four of the genealogical proof standard. Then you would evaluate and make a to-do list. What kinds of research do you need to do before you can accept um, the research that you have inherited as true. Then you can add the new information to your tree. Tip, do keep a running to-do list as you evaluate. So how do you evaluate new information? Is the source of the information cited? If it's not, I'm, I'm sorry, if it is, you need to evaluate how good the source is. Does the collection contain records that support the new information, even though there's no citation? Then we evaluate the record. Is this information reasonable, given what I know about the time, place, and family? Basically, it's a sniff test. Um, it, if it smells okay, it probably is. But you do, on your to-do list, you will find a source for the information. And for those of you who are more visually inclined, as you review your relatives' pedigree charts and family group sheets or even notes, ask, ask yourself about these facts. Is this fact new? If it's not, great. You already knew it. You've probably got documentation for it. You can move on to the next fact. So if it is new, is there any documentation of where that fact came from? Yes, then you evaluate how good that particular source was. If there's no citation, you look through your collection. Is there a document that supports the fact? If yes, you also go to the evaluation and you will eva evaluate how good that document is. If no, does this fact make sense for the time, place, and what I already know? Yes, then you also go to evaluation and you are going to be looking for a supporting material. If your answer across the board is no, then this may be an unreliable fact that you have. Okay, let's talk about the principles of analysis. Analysis focuses on sources and information. To analyze a source, you make a determination whether the source is original, derivative, or authored. And I'm going to walk you through some examples. For the information, you make a determination about whether it is first-hand, second-hand, or 
I have no idea. You can't tell. So let's go back to this document from Deborah Hall Grosvenor Newton's book. Um, we don't really know what any of this means. So how do we evaluate whether or not we can accept the information about the Grosvenor family that is written down here? This is all lovely information that I did not have in 2000, um, but it needed to be evaluated. So evaluating Maud's copy, are the facts cited? No. The notation at the top of the page is dramatically unclear. It just says it's from Deborah Hall Grosvenor Newton's book. Is it a Bible? Is it a journal? Or maybe it's a family history. Is there anything in the collection that you have inherited that contains the information? Uh, no. Does the information make sense for the time and the place in the family? Well, in this case, yes, it does. So what do I do with that? Let's take a closer look at the sources. Original, from the time period being research. It includes duplicate originals, copies, image copies, digital copies, um, uh, photos are considered original for analysis purposes. So here we have the image on the right is a digital image of an original probate from Frederick County, um, Maryland. Now, Maud's copy is just that. It's a copy. It's not an original. So it is derivative. Derivative means written by someone who did not experience the events of the time period. It includes transcripts, extracts, and abstracts. Well, Maud's handwritten transcription does fall into this category. The challenge of using derivative materials is that there is always the possibility that you have to con consider that there may have been transcription errors or perhaps the writer's memory somehow affects the contents. And then the third type of source are authored sources. The quality of compiled genealogies depends on the quality of the citations. How faithfully do the authors document their facts? Two boxes of my grandmother's collection included published books, but it took me quite a while to figure out which books um, and how reliable the information was. So we've talked about evaluating the source. Is it original, derivative, or authored? Let's move over to the information. When we are evaluating the information, is it firsthand? That is, is it from a participant in an event? I'd give it a green check. Was it reported soon after the event, such as a marriage? I'd give it a green check. If it was from someone um, who was a participant, but they reported it long after the event, maybe we better go slow, a yellow check. If it is secondhand from a non-participant, it's definitely a yellow. If it was reported soon after the event, fine, um, but it's still yellow because it was from a non-participant. If it was reported long after the event, we're getting into warning territory. We're getting into red check marks. And if we can't tell who provided the information, definitely a red check. So who provided the information in the record? The most reliable information is provided by a participant. If someone else provided the information, it's sort of like the children's game of telephone. Person number one may say, Aunt Kate got married in December, but was born in May. And by the time it makes its way back over here to person number six, what person number six may hear is Aunt Kate got married and her son was born in May. Hmm, that's rather different. This is the marriage record of my great grandparents, James Lothers and Elizabeth Wallers, Lothers, Wallace, excuse me. And here it shows that the minister was the individual who provided the information for this town clerk's record. 
We also need to consider how long after an event the information was written down. This is important because it gives us a clue as to whether memory might be an issue. Here is an example of arrival in the US at a port. Let's say the first record is a passenger list filed within a day or two of arrival. But what if instead we're looking at the 1900 census and the date of immigration was uh, provided to the enumerator? If the arrival uh, was given as 1859 and the head of the household is now 85, how accurate do we think that date is actually going to be? Back to my great grandparents' marriage. There are two dates here. There was the date of the marriage, February 15th in Boston, and the date of the record, April 1st. It was about 45 days after the marriage that the clerk of the city of Cambridge wrote down the marriage, but that's generally not too bad. So our to-do list for the item on Maud's list of data about the Grosvenor family is, it's an authored, uh, the, the kind, we need to find confirmation. And we might look for authored genealogies with citations, or we might go and look at the town records of Pomfret, Connecticut. Do start slowly, one line, at a time. Now let's evaluate another example. This is the manuscript which I mostly or I completely ignored for 20 years, but I read through it much more carefully as I was preparing for this lecture. And lo and behold, I see it mentions the Carringtons and the Taylors. Wow. I have been periodically trolling through online sources for these families, but unfortunately, their names are common. I was trying to take them from London, Ontario, back into England, but there are an awful lot of George Taylors around there for this time period. But here, buried in the middle and actually crossed out, is that the parish church was St. Thomas a Becket and the town was Chapel and Le Frith in Derbyshire in England. I have a clue. I have a clue that I didn't know I had. Now here's the fan chart that uh, my grandmother, Jennifred, had. And she wrote down George Taylor, born 1819, wrote down his father as Joseph Taylor and his mother as Mary Carrington. So there were documents in the uh, collection, but they didn't provide me with the proof that I needed. So I have new facts. I have an English location. Are the facts cited? Alas, no. Is there a document or book in the collection that contains the information? Uh, no. But does the information make sense for the time, place, and family? Yes. So I'm going to add to my to-do list. This time, my to-do list is going to be to examine the church records of Chapel and Lafrith for George Taylor's birth in 1819 and the marriage of Joseph Taylor and Mary Cunningham. Now, some of you definitely would want to take this route where you would put the information on that fan chart into software, print it out, and then color code it. This is much more visually um, engaging than a long running to-do list. I've marked in yellow those people where that were uh, needed to be verified. Um, I've marked with red where I needed to find a fact and uh, in blue where I needed documentation. There's no standard for any kind of color coding here. It's completely up to you. Well, now you've made a nice long list of to-dos and you need to check them out. How do you organize that those to-dos and actually do the verification research? Let's talk about planning. As with doing any kind of family history research, there are steps to making a research plan. 
This chart is from a section of a class I teach on research planning, where the focus is on a single, well-focused research question. In the case of inherited research, you're going to have lots and lots of questions that need to be answered. So let's see how this framework could be used to plan your verification research. So step number one is, what do you want to learn? What is crucial here is you're going to need to uh, make sure that you've got a sense of a name, a place, and a date. Okay. So questions for the George Taylor Plowman line. When and where was Selena Taylor, wife of George Plowman of Lesur, Minnesota, born? I didn't put the time period in there. That's my bad. I should have. Because records are specific to a time and a place. Were George Taylor and Louise Velcher, probably of Ontario, Canada, married in 1841, the parents of Salina? Were the parents of George Taylor, uh, Joseph Taylor, and Mary Carrington of England? You get the idea. You have your questions, but now what do you know about your questions? You specifically need to focus on how you know something. It's not just good enough that you've heard it. You need to know where you heard it. So here is what um, I put together in terms of those questions about the Taylor family. I'm looking to find births and birth marriages and deaths for these people. So I'm looking for documentation about her birth. From the US federal census, I know that she was born about 1848 in Canada. Well, in order to find a record, I'm going to have to be a little bit more specific than Canada. Canada is rather large. I'm in better shape for the Taylors. I'm looking to document George's birth in Chapel in La Frith in England and potentially find his marriage and death in London, Ontario. And I know this from Maud's notes. Okay, so this is part of the process of making sure that you have names, places, and dates before or at least hypotheses about dates and places before you start your work. Then you get to do your homework. You need to learn um, about a place and a time because records are specific to a place and time. So from the previous table, the clues that are closest to finding a record source are those Chapel and La Frith records. The clues about Canada and Ontario for George need refining before I can actually start searching for the records. Then you can put it all together and create a plan. So I'm going to group locations. Records are by locations. So one location I'm going to be looking at is Chapel and Lafrith in Derbyshire in the early 19th century. I'm going to be looking in London, Middlesex County, Ontario in the mid 19th century. I'm going to focus on church and cemetery records. What order will I search? I'm going to take a guess that those Chapel and Lafrith records are going to be easier than some of the other uh, questions, so I will start with them. And you need to keep a research log. It keeps track of what you are searching and what you have found, and it prevents rework. Here's an example of a research log that you could possibly download from American Ancestors to uh, keep track of your work. So what do you do when you get a collection? First, you survey it. You identify what's in it and identify what names are associated with those materials. You classify and organize your collection to make finding items easier in the future. You review the genealogical research and evaluate it according to the principles of the genealogical proof standard. Are there sources that cite this research? Are, am I looking at original data or deriv derivative data? 
was the informant someone who knew the people involved or was this a secondhand secondary um, information then create a running to do list with the questions that surface make a list uh, make a plan for conducting your research. Then you can check items off your to do list and add the new information or the corrected information to your tree. And by the way, I did find the birth of George Taylor in 1819 in Chapel Inn, Lafrith, Derbyshire. But I discovered his father was John, not Joseph. And I found Joseph and Mary's marriage record in 1814. So it was quite the uh, fortuitous find uh, as I was preparing for this uh, particular webinar. So thank you very much. Great, thank you, Anne, for that wonderful presentation. Um, a lot of great tips and advice there um, for people to apply to their own collections. Um, before we jump into our Q&A session for today, I wanted to mention two online programs that I think will be especially interesting for this audience. Um, if you're tuning in today, chances are you have a stack of family papers or photographs tucked away that you don't really know what to do with. Um, I did want to mention our virtual preservation roadshow, which will teach you best practices, again, for surveying, handling, and storing family materials and really provide you with expert advice on how to care for items in your collection. Um, so in, in addition to reviewing how to videos, participants will be able to submit a photo of one item from their collection and receive some advice from our archivists and conservator. Um, participants gain access to over three hours worth of instructional videos, handouts, and articles, and the program culminates with a live Q&A with our experts on Saturday, January 22nd. So while Anne's session today really focused on continuing that important research from inherited family collections, this event will focus more on the preservation and care of those items, which I know um, was a topic of interest to those of you who registered today. I'm looking a little further ahead, um, please save the date for Tuesday, March 8th, when we're joined by Matt Paxton. Um, Matt's a past expert on the A&E TV series Hoarders and is the current host of the PBS show Legacy List with Matt Paxton. Uh, Matt will discuss his new book, Keep the Memories, Lose the Stuff, Declutter, Downsize, and Move Forward with Your Life in a special virtual book talk and extended Q&A. Um, in this event, Matt will reveal tips on how to treasure, but not stockpile, uh, your beloved family items. Um, registration will open soon for that event on our website. Um, of course, to learn more about um, these two events and others, um, we invite you to visit our event calendar at AmericanAncestors.org slash events, and we hope that you'll join us for another virtual event soon. So with that, um, now let's answer your questions. Um, you can certainly submit more in that Q&A panel, and we'll answer as many as we can um, in the time we have left today. Um, first off, I did want to address a couple um, items that I saw in the Q&A panel. Um, a bunch of people were asking about um, getting copies of the blank uh, survey form and um, the research uh, template, research plan template. Um, and we can post those um, with the recording in our video library. So all of you will have access to um, download and use those um, as you see useful in your own collections. Um, and I wanted to remind people as well that this um, entire presentation is being recorded, will be posted on our video library on our website later this evening. Um, so you can uh, review that on your own time. You can um, pause, rewind, take notes, um, and that will be up indefinitely for you to access. Um, all right, so let's continue on with your questions out there. Um, we had a, a few about um, looking at types of sources, derivative, things like that, that you talked about, Anne. Um, so we had one question. Um, uh, can a participant include a family member who might have experienced 
the event, for example, grandparents' vital records of their descendants or a sibling who recorded the event. Um, could you talk a little bit more about maybe how closely that person has to be to the actual event? Well, let's let's uh, use the example of, say, a marriage. Obviously, you're going to have more than just the bride and the groom, um, at least uh, most of the time. Um, yes, the uh, the parents who were there, if they have firsthand knowledge or the grandparents, if they have firsthand knowledge, that is con considered um, a uh, firsthand participant. It doesn't necessarily have to be just the bride and the groom and the minister. Uh, that was that was the example. But if they were physically there, um, and certainly uh, in many cases, the informant for death certificates may have had personal knowledge of the parents of the uh, deceased um, if they had lived with them or had grown up with them. So it's it's not quite as narrow as apparently I made it seem. Great, thank you for addressing that, Anne, um, adding some clarification there. Um, another question that we're getting a lot in the Q&A panel um, is about a donation uh, to a repository, which I know um, is more handled here at American Ancestors NEHGS by our um, senior archivist, Judy Lucy. Um, but I don't know if you have any tips, Anne, about maybe searching for a relevant repository out there and how you might go about doing that? Excellent question. Um, I would recommend taking a look at the uh, places uh, addressed by your collection. So if your collection is specific to say Saranac Lake, New York, um, you are probably going to be looking for a um, Clinton or Franklin County um, historical society or an Adirondack historical society uh, to see if they might be interested in your material. So uh, if you're looking for uh, an historical society or other group to take collection, um, do consider the names and the places that are involved. Also, when you contact uh, the historical society, find out if they have surname files. Many historical societies do, and I'm sure that they would welcome additional material if it's for surnames that they are very familiar with for the region um, that someone was, was living in. Also, the uh, webinar, which I referenced at the beginning on organizing um, and preserving your family papers, does talk about preparing a collection for donation and what's needed to do uh, for that. And it's the organization and the classification and um, storing, safe storing that is uh, the, are the important steps prior to a donation. But part of that organization helps you identify uh, whether or not a group might be interested. So if you've got three or four different places listed in your collection, where do most of the papers fall? Do they mostly fall um, in, say, Geneva, New York? Or do they mostly fall in Saranac Lake? If it's one or two papers for Saranac Lake and folders full for Geneva, you're going to contact a historical society nearer to Geneva. Great, that's a great example. Thank you for that advice, Anne. Um, a couple other questions in our last um, minute or two together. Um, we had a couple questions about, um, again, organizing some of this research. Is there a standard for color coding the four family lines? Um, Yes, actually there is. And it's related to a system developed by Mary Hill, uh, who was an archivist. And it's the color coding that I illustrated on the fan chart where the father's father's line is blue, the father's mother's line is green, the mother's father's line is red, and the mother's mother's line is yellow. But that's the only standard 
color coding system that um, I have much familiarity with. The rest of it is up to you. Great, thank you, Anne. Um, one last question to round out our time together. Um, how much reliability do you, in general, give to the info from the federal census? Well, interesting <laughs> question, because the federal census enumerator did not have to talk to the family. If the census enumerator had made multiple attempts over a period of, I think, a month to contact the family, they could talk to the neighbors. And you would just hope that the neighbor um, uh, knew what they were talking about. The couple of things about the census, one is uh, people were not asked to spell their names. So spelling was, how shall we say, flexible. It depended on how the enumerator heard it. Um, and you can imagine with some of our ancestors, accents might have been a, a big issue. And so not only do you have someone speaking English where it's not their first language, but you have an enumerator who's struggling to figure out what was being said. So you take the spelling of names with a large grain of salt. The other grain of salt has to do with ages. Uh, people, I don't think deliberately lied about their ages, but the older you get, the more time telescopes. And so uh, you may be 70, but feel like you're 50. And so <laughs> you tell the enumerator that you're 50. If, if you've grown up in an agricultural society or one that does not really pay attention to dates and particularly dates of birth, then there's going to be a fair amount of fluidity in, in what gets reported on the, on the census. Great answer there, Anne. I know that's a, a big topic about a really important genealogical resource. Um, well, thank you again, Anne, for your great presentation. Um, unfortunately, that's all the time we have today, um, but I wanna thank all of you out there for providing such thoughtful questions. Um, we will have a, a record of all of your questions, um, so we may be following up with some of you outside of the session. Um, if you do have more specific questions about your family history research, um, you may also want to consider working with our research services team who conducts research for hire. Um, you can learn more by contacting research at nehgs.org. Um, you can also go to americanancestors.org slash chat to take advantage of our free chat with a genealogist service. This is great if you have quick reference questions. It's free and available to all Tuesday through Saturday, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Um, finally, thank you for joining us again. Um, as you leave the event, you'll have the opportunity to fill out a survey and give us your feedback. As we continue to expand our webinars and online programs, any and all feedback is extremely helpful and appreciated. This free webinar was made possible by the generous support of members and friends around the world. Please consider making a gift to American ancestors to keep these programs free and to create more free programs for you. Um, stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you all at our online programs in the future. Goodbye for now.